This is Carrie Welsh, and I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about my research that I've been working on. I was inspired uh, to do the uh, topic that I chose because of a tour uh, to Charleston. We toured the old provost dungeon uh, in the exchange building, which is right on the, on the harbor, uh, and it played an integral role during the revolution. That tea party uh, uh, that was happening in Boston had a similar... Uh, tea Party in Charleston and in Philadelphia, we read in um, Empire on the Edge that England was still sending the shipments with uh, tea to be, or with tea that had tax to be collected upon um, disembarkment. And in Charleston, they handled it a little bit differently. So the story I was told was that they uh, unloaded the tea, secretly uh, speared it away, and stored it in the Old Provost Dungeon with some gunpowder that they had acquired, and the Patriots walled up that section of the dungeon. So later, when they were occupied by the British, it was undiscovered. And when the uh, Patriots took back control, they were able to get it out of the dungeon to be able to use that as an asset to sell to actually fund the Patriot uh, military ex militia experience in, in the southern colonies. And I found that fascinating, and I wanted to research to see what truths I could uh, find. And uh, it turns out it was actually really close to what I discovered. Uh, they took a much more conservative approach in the South. Uh, they were driven uh, largely by economic interests and loyalties, and um, the ideolo ideologic ideological um, priorities of the Patriots um, tended to be very pragmatic. Uh, so whoever offered them the best opportunity, they tend to align with. Although leaders like Charles Gadsden, I did discover, were uh, very intertwined with the Northern Sons of Liberty. So that being said, uh, they were Patriots, but they were conservative Patriots. I also discovered that in the back country of South Carolina, uh, in the research uh, by, uh, it was Rebecca Brannon, that the revolution time period in the southern back country represented more of a civil war between brother versus brother, neighbor versus neighbor, more divided than even the American Civil War that would be another 70 years later, 80 years later. So it was hotly contested and then largely back to that uh, economic opportunity driven um, decision making. So uh, again, over and over again, the British overestimated the loyalists, uh, the loyalty that they would have in the backcountry colonists. And this culminated in an ultimatum, an ultimatum that was sent out by uh, Patrick Ferguson's troops to the overmountain frontiersmen. So the the the, gener the per pervasive attitude in the back country was just we'll just stay out of it for as long as possible. That was Flora McDonald's um, and the Highlanders mentality. That was also in the back country. That just stay out of it. Let's just stay out of it and survive. Uh, so th that was especially true of the frontiersmen who went over the Appalachian Mountains and settled in what is now East Tennessee. However, once they were given an ultimatum, they did uh, fight back against what they perceived to be tyranny and rule and and their um, closely guarded independence and liberty, and they marched over the mountain and uh, defeated defeated Patrick Ferguson at the Battle of Kings Mountain. So my examination of the Southern resistance as a whole and how it differed to the Northern resistance uh, pretty much came down to a uh, very conservative, protective stance over economic viability which, if you read David Hackett Fisher's Albion Seed, um, makes it very easy to see why these largely Scots-Irish immigrants who came to this area looking for economic security, stability, and personal property would have valued those things in a way uh, different, uh, in a different way than the northern, um, the northern colonies who came for ideological liberty principles to begin with. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed my research. Thank you so much.